Hello, Nancy. Hey, Shane. <laughs> all right. So I have a I have a question for you. Yep. Bring it on as you usually do. Uh, all right. Uh, if you had to choose, would you rather climb Mount Everest or hike across Death Valley? Climb Mount Everest. Why? You seem very sure about this. Okay. A, you get to the top of something. I mean, that's impressive. Versus what? Getting across something that's not as impressive? <laughs> I wish people could see your face. And then... <laughs> And then, uh, B, you have a Sherpa. Oh, oh. So, so it's <laughs> an not oxygen, a, an oxygen. So it's not necessarily about like the achievement. It's about the fact that you get to like have someone help you with your achievement to then get no credit for your achievement. It's like a walk in the park. It's like a walk in the park. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, I like I think Mount Everest, too, but not because I just like cold. Like you can always like put more clothes on than like take clothes off. True. I mean, hot is just unbearable sometimes. But I guess you could hire like a Sherpa to take you with you across Death Valley who just like would fan you Ooh. the entire time. <laughs> no, that was, that's something. Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompey. And this is Third Pod from the Sun, Centennial Edition. Okay, so I asked you about extreme conditions because today we're talking about Antarctica. That's extreme. That's the coldest place on Earth. I mean, the coldest place on Earth is there. Thank you, Nancy, for, <laughs> for informing us of that. So we have our producer, <laughs> Lauren LaPuma, uh, is here to tell us more about Antarctica. Hi, Lauren. Hello, everyone. As we're, as we're laughing through this. <laughs> um, yeah, so Antarctica in the 19th century was one of kind of the last unexplored places in the world. And people from all over Europe were leading expeditions there. Yeah, and there was, so it was like, who, like Scott? And there was, was there a Fitzgerald in there? No, it's like, I don't Scott. Fitzgerald, no, Jane. That was an F, author. Not F. Scott Fitzgerald, <laughs> Nancy. There was Shackleton. Scott, comma. <laughs> Sp- oh, uh, Shackleton. Shackleton. All right. Lawson. I, I don't remember the others. But Anyways, okay. But yeah, Scott is actually one of the people we're going to talk about because he, so Sc- Robert Falcon Scott was a British explorer. He had been in the Royal Navy. He was big into exploring. He led an expedition to Antarctica in 1901 that was trying to get all the way to the South Pole, but they didn't make it that year. Why, uh, why didn't they make it to the South Pole? Well, the weather why was really you bad. Think they didn't <laughs> make it. <laughs> they just were like, it was really ah, cold. We're done. We're gonna go home. I'm over it. Yeah, they they <laughs> <laughs> couldn't handle the cold, Nancy. They weren't prepared. <laughs> it was it was bad. Yeah, but I'm sure it was it was terrible. Yeah, that's gotta suck. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so well, they didn't make it that trip, but they did discover the Antarctic Plateau which is like the really high cold plateau in the middle of Antarctica, and that's where the South Pole is. So they, they just see something, though. Well, did they – so did they try to go back? Yeah, so Scott went back. They went back 10 years later in 1911. But at that point, he was competing with a party of Norwegian explorers led by Roald Amundsen. And Amundsen had pretty much dedicated himself to a life of exploration, and he was really determined to be the first person to ever reach the South Pole. So ultimately what happened was that – Amundsen and his team did reach the South Pole first. They mm. got there in December of 1911. And Scott's team reached the pole in January of 1912. But tragically, he and all of his team members died on the ice. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah, it's really sad. They never made it back. Oh. But, you know, the reason this story came up is that recently I met a meteorologist, Ryan Fote, who con- reconstructed the weather conditions in, Ar- in Antarctica at the beginning of the 21st, 20th sorry, century and actually during that year of the South Pole race. And he found some really bizarre weather conditions that may have played a role in the outcome of that race. Yeah, I'm Ryan Fode. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Geography at Ohio University. And I teach meteorology classes here at Ohio University. And then I also do research on Antarctic climate variability. As a grad student, I got the opportunity to go to Antarctica. Um, and so that, that experience changed me and made me so fascinated by the continent. It made me so fascinated by the place and the, 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 the large changes in weather and climate that they can have down there because of the unique environment that uh, a lot of Antarctic people call it getting ice in the veins. It's one of those experiences. Once you've been down to Antarctica, it fills you in a way that you don't want to ever leave or certainly don't want to ever not research it and, and think about it. 
So you've done some research on kind of the history of Antarctica's climate. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, this last project I had with the National Science Foundation was to um, take Antarctic pressure records and to extend those back into time as far as we could go. And we were using station records from many different bases that had long-term records starting in around 1957. And we were able to extend those records back into time to the beginning of the 20th century using mid-latitude pressure records from uh, stations in like New Zealand and Australia and South America and South uh, Africa and relate those statistically in a model uh, to predict uh, what were the changes like in these stations in across Antarctica. Tell me what it really means to have like negative pressure trend versus a positive pr pressure trend. Basically, how does that affect the weather and yeah. the conditions? Yeah. So in Antarctica, when you have a negative pressure trend, uh, you tend to strengthen the winds around the continent. In most places over the continent, that tends to keep it colder uh, because these stronger winds, in part, um, lock in the Antarctic air. Uh, most places when uh, the winds are stronger around Antarctica tend to be colder. So then what did you find out when you looked back into the early 20th century? I got this really interesting finding when I looked at certain reconstructions themselves. And a, a lot of them showed this really interesting signal of a really strong high pressure in 1911, 1912, that one summer. Uh, and that's the summer that the South Pole race was going on. So when the British expedition and the Norwegian expedition were, were um, you know, first coming to Antarctica. And, well, the Norwegians the first time. The British, this is one of the many times. But they, they're with the goal of going to the South Pole. And uh, I was like, whoa, this is really interesting. There's this big spike in pressure at many stations. I wonder if something was going on during that South Pole year, that race of that expedition, uh, that we didn't know about before. Can you tell me a little context and background of the South Pole race of 1911-1912? Yeah, so it, it technically wasn't a race. I guess from the British side, they they were out to do science pole. So they had this, you know, goal of getting to the South Pole, but along the way, they also wanted to collect data uh, and uh, learn a lot more about the continent. The Norwegians also um, wanted to data, but they, they, that was not their main goal. I think their goal was more to, to be a race and to be the first to lay claim to making it to the South Pole. When did they when did they start? When did they reach the continent? Both parties wintered over, so they experienced the Antarctic winter through Jan, uh, June, July, August. Um, and so they, then it was a matter of when did it get warm enough and safe enough for us to journey south. So they had spent the winter there in 1911, and then they decided to make a run for the pole. Yes. Yeah. And um, they left roughly in the same time. Amundsen set out in the end of October and Scott set out in the beginning of November. So about a couple weeks apart. Amundsen actually has a fairly um, uneventful journey uh, for the most part. And so they had a really efficient plan of how to get to the pole quickly. And uh, they used dog sleds primarily to... Um, get their sledge and sledges and their, their supplies and the people to the pole and back. On the way, they're laying depots, so they're laying, laying some supplies that they're carefully marking uh, so that they can have those on the way back. So they don't have to carry all of their uh, supplies with them to the pole and back. And they were very carefully marked um, with flags so that they would see them um, if they were not precisely on the same path. Amundsen particularly set out, you know, these flags well away from the actual site and well in advance of the site on both sides so that they could see it on their return. Amundsen's route was a little bit steeper and more treacherous to get up than uh, uh, the one that um, the, the British Polar Party had taken. Um, but because of that, they, were, they spent less time on the plateau. And so they, they arrive at a farther south latitude when they get onto the plateau. And so the plateau is much colder. Uh, and um, then, yeah, then they have this quick, relatively quick journey to the pole from once they climb that glacier and then returning back. And so, yeah, because of that, you know, Amundsen and his crew reached the South Pole uh, about a month earlier than the British party. Uh, they reached there on December 14th, 1911, and, uh, you know, returned quickly after reaching the pole, laid the, laid the Norwegian flag down, uh, even left a note for Scott. Uh, and so they returned quickly and then... Um, got back to their main base, Framheim, and 
packed up their ships and left and were off the continent by the end of February. So they made this really quick turnaround and, and uh, were very efficient. And so they were making a lot quicker progress down and back than the British party, which was uh, primarily manhauling their sledges. So they were pulling them. Uh, they tried ponies. They tried motors. They had some limited success with that. Um, they ended up abandoning the main polar party, and been abandoned those things, and ended up pulling uh, the sledges all the way to the South Pole and back, essentially. Uh, and so they were moving a little bit slower because of, <laughs> because of wow. that. They weren't having dogs do most of their work. Um, uh, they uh, took a little bit longer to reach the pole, and they reached the pole in January of 1912 and um, had seen evidence that Amundsen had beaten them, beat them there. So Wait, Amundsen left a note, you said, right? That's right, <laughs> yeah. What did it say? Uh, so um, it uh, you know, essentially told P- Scott that you know, we, we, were, we were already here um, and congratulating him for making it that far. Um, <laughs> But uh, also to, should I not make it off the continent to, to deliver this news as well um, of, of, my, of my claim to the, to the South Pole? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, to see that it was, I'm sure, demoralizing for his whole crew, who were already starting to fail in health. In addition to, like, all the physical labor that they had done, they were, um, you know, this condition called scurvy affected a lot of early explorers and it's a vitamin C deficiency uh, that um, wasn't known about at all during that time because we hadn't discovered vitamins or didn't know about the effect of vitamins and and deficiencies in vitamins and so they um, they didn't have as much health uh, because of what they're eating Um, whereas Amundsen they they would actually slaughter some of their dogs and eat their dogs Um, and then the dogs eat the dogs uh, to provide a little bit more more nourishment, and so they the, they weren't getting this, the same sort of nourishment in the British party. The, the end of the story is that um, unfortunately none of the British party made it even back to their main base. Uh, all of them perish on their return journey uh, as they are going either from the the plateau down, or most of the uh, members of the party died once they reached the Ross Ice Shelf in that leg of the journey back to their main base at Cape Evans. I, I can't believe that these British guys just pulled their sledges all the way to the South Pole. What sledge? A sled. <laughs> it's a sled. <laughs> it's a sled. It's a sled with a few extra letters, yeah. Nancy. It's a toboggan, if you will. It's very British. A sledge. As yeah. it were. Same thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, how did weather factor into all of this? Well, like Ryan was saying, when he looked back and reconstructed the atmospheric pressures over Antarctica in the 20th century... He found that during the time that Scott and Amundsen were making their way towards the South Pole, the pressures were unusually high. And what that means is that the winds were weaker around the continent and the temperatures were really exceptionally warm. Well, hmm. for Antarctica, it's still pretty cold. But that actually affected how the two, the two expeditions in different ways. We did find, indeed, with those high-pressure anomalies that we saw that were really unique, uh, but they were also associated many times with really high-temperature anomalies. Uh, For Amundsen in particular, there is this period in the early part of December 1911 when they had just reached onto the plateau, uh, but not quite to the South Pole yet, where they experienced many consecutive days of really warm conditions. Those temperatures were averaging warmer than minus 19 degrees Celsius. And it doesn't sound very warm, but when you put it in comparison of what it's like on the plateau, you are very far south, you are at very high elevation. Uh, those conditions are, are really exceptionally warm. Amundsen had experienced really warm conditions that he also wrote about in his journal, uh, in his diary, um, saying that, you know, this is quite sultry. Uh, and uh, we didn't expect this, essentially. Uh, and um, it worked, even though... Um, it was warm. It was still like a blizzard for them. But it, because they're on the plateau, it, moisture is quite limited there. And so it was a dry snow. And it didn't really impede his progress. He was still able to make progress through that time. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas 
at the exact same time that Amundsen was recording these exceptionally warm c- conditions, uh, Scott was also recording really warm conditions, but they were on the Ross ice shelf. And the temperatures were actually uh, at or above freezing uh, for that time. And so there was snow falling, but it was this heavy, wet snow uh, with a lot more moisture there. And it delayed them. They, they um, chose to camp out much of that time or didn't make very much progress mm-hmm. um, during that same period where Amundsen was experiencing warmth that was helping him. Scott was experiencing those conditions, but was set back by it. And uh, people were commenting in their journals about how warm and wet it was um, and how kind of miserable it was for their clothes and, and the conditions and, and pulling their sledges in that conditions was not favorable either because it wouldn't slide very well on such warm, wet snow and it just get buried more. Uh, and so it really slowed and hindered their progress um, in that period of December. Certainly those conditions worked to Amundsen's favor, mm-hmm. um, whereas they tend to hinder scott's progress at that time in december Mm -hmm. and then so what happened over the rest of the course of that summer uh so the the amundsen party you know goes back and they get off the um the continent but scott's party is still there are they still experiencing these unusual temperatures then yeah early early february um they had these warm conditions again when they're on the top of the beardmore glacier um and then they were followed by relatively colder conditions at the bottom of the Beardmore Glacier after they descended and made it back to the, the um, Ross Ice Shelf. We found that that change from those warm conditions to that cold condition uh, at the end, uh, that change was relatively rare too. Um, in fact, we looked at um, 30, more than 30 years of data and um, you know the probability that that kind of shift from really warm conditions to colder conditions at the end of February and into early March Um, would happen with less than 5% chance. Things then got cold, um, even colder for Scott and his crew, um, and um, more likely played a role in their demise. Mm -hmm. So did you, when in the course of doing this research, did you go through and read Emmonson and Scott's like personal accounts of this journey or, and then the the crew? Yes, so I I, actually, even more in our history than than just those two. Um, So I I, I got their their, uh, diaries that have been published um, and I read about them and and kind of try to put myself into their their place, you know, and and having been to the South Pole, having seen it uh, really put into perspective for me what they might have faced and endured as they were going down. Even though the the British expedition didn't turn out um, necessarily favorably, they didn't win in terms of getting to the South Pole first, uh, I think a lot of people applaud the, the, the British party for that expedition in particular for what they did for science. I mean, th- that, that was their goal. And so, you know, even in those warm conditions when they're coming down um, on the Beardmore and it was above average, they, they didn't use that as a necessary time to accelerate their pace. They actually used it t- as time to collect more samples. And so they... they well, and what, and what exactly were they looking at? They were collecting rock samples. They called it geologizing. They were out, out there, <laughs> you know, picking up more rocks to, to carry and increase their weight on the sledges um, so that they could learn more about them. And Simpson, the main meteorologist there, did a great job of, of summarizing that, not only from that one, but from the previous expedition uh, and, and putting it into these books and, and writing about the Antarctic meteorology that he had learned. And so. I think it did a lot to help understand, you know, what Antarctica was like and what kind of conditions we could expect. Well, does anyone want to make a trip to the South Pole? Only with, if you pull our sledges. With with our with our sledges and toboggans. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, I want I want a toboggan for sure. You want a toboggan? Yeah. No, I'm not gonna pull. But no, didn't two two people just like solo to the South Pole? Maybe we could like talk to them. Right. Sure. <laughs> all right. So that's all from Third Pod from the Sun Centennial Edition. Thanks so much to Lauren for bringing us this story and to Ryan for sharing his work with us. This podcast is also produced with help from Josh Spicer, Olivia Ambrosio, Katie Brundle, and Liza Lester. And thanks to Robin Murray for producing this episode. We'd love to hear your thoughts on our podcast. Please read and review us. Um, listen to us wherever you get your podcasts or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. And be on the lookout for more of the Centennial episodes to come. As well as our regular episodes, oh which boy. are great, too. They're super great. All right. Thanks, all. And we'll see you next time.